I'm sure that uh, most of you here, especially if you're older, you are familiar with the song Days of Elijah, right? You know, these are the days of Elijah. That's an awesome, awesome song. Now, it is a little dated. It's a few years old there. In fact, it was, it was, a, it was a big hit in the late 1990s and going into the 2000s. And it played on Christian radio all day long. And if you were a church that did uh, contemporary Christian music, you did Days of Elijah because it was, I mean, it was a popular song. We did it back in the day, back when uh, uh, we were downtown. We were a storefront church here in Athens. And, uh, and, and hey, here, you know, here's something. Did you know that 20 years ago this November, 20 years ago this November, we officially became a church. We've been here 20 years now. So let's thank the Lord for that. Now, here's what's really special about this. If we go back... 20 years ago, back, I keep saying back in the day, because, I mean, for me, it's kind of back in the day, okay? Um, but uh, we, were, we were a storefront church, Pentecostal, charismatic, prophetic type church, non-denominational. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but back then, the odds of a church like us surviving even three years, I mean, it was like it didn't happen. Uh, lots of churches like us started up, but they were finished within a year. And to make it even seven years was, I mean, that was incredible, but here we are 20 years later, and we're, we're still going strong. So come on, let's thank the Lord. We're doing two services. We had a big crowd this morning. I mean, our 9 a.m. crowd, it actually increased. I think our uh, 11 a.m. service here, I, I'm, looking, I'm, looking, I'm scanning the crowd. Looks like we got a great crowd this morning, lots of energy. So God is good. Somebody say God is good. Great things are happening here at Ascension Life. Now, here's the thing. I'm... Getting back to the song Day, uh, Days of Elijah, I'm not here to really uh, so much talk about the song uh, Days of Elijah as I am to talk about really what I feel like the, the Lord is saying as it pertains to the song Days of Elijah. I got, a, I got a fan here on the front row for sure. Hey, buddy. Hey, hey, hey. Come on. I got my little grandsons up here. What a blessing. I, I wish you could see what I could see. But... Uh, but, but anyway, uh, about three or four weeks ago, uh, I was on social media and I saw a video of a Marine unit. Uh, they were in a, they were, uh, it was a church service. I don't know, maybe some of you have seen this video. But this is a bunch of Marines. You know, Marines are tough. And I'm an Army guy, so I can say that for sure, okay? Um, but I don't know if you've seen this video or not. But they're, they're all, they're in a church service. They're they're locked arm to arm, and they are swaying back and forth, and they are singing Days of Elijah. And it's an awesome video, and, and watching the video, I mean, i tell you what, it just blessed my heart. It really did. And so anyway, watch the video. I got the song going in my head, and, and one of the reasons, I mean, I had the song in my head, because going back 20 years ago, we did, as I said earlier, we did that song here at Ascension Life. In fact, kind of update some of you here, 20 years ago, uh, I was the worship leader, okay? The worship team, the worship band we had, I was the worship leader. I played acoustic guitar and sang. Let's see, we had Mike Elkins on bass, who's one of our elders. We had Jim Coutre, he was here this morning. He played acoustic guitar, he's one of our elders. We had John Knox on drums, he's sitting right over here. And he was rocking, I mean, listen, that's right. I mean, he was a beast on the drums and... And you know what? And, and we rocked the house. I mean, it was a good worship team. We're going to put that team back together for one service, uh, you know, uh, here in the future when we do our, when we do our anniversary service. But, uh, but anyway, anytime we did Days of Elijah, I mean, we, it, I mean it really, really um, moved the church because there's just something about that song. It's an anointed song. And I know there are people that say, well, inanimate things can't be anointed. I, I beg to differ. Yes, they can. All you got to do is get into the book of Acts and see that, that the apostle Paul even anointed handkerchiefs and aprons, sent those handkerchiefs and aprons out. And did you know people got healed just by touching those, uh, touching the handkerchiefs, uh, you know, the aprons? People literally got healed. And so things can be anointed. I've read books that were anointed that had a profound impact on my life, like Two Trees in the Garden or The Final Quest by Rick Joyner or The Three Battlegrounds by Francis Frangipane. I don't know if you guys have read those. Those are some amazing books. 
But it's true, paintings can be anointed. I mean, Becky paints over here, and we got Jaden paints. I mean, we've seen some good paintings in this place that, that where you know that God is speaking and saying something through things of that nature and, and are anointed. Now, here's the thing. As I said, I, I'm not so much here to talk about the song, Days of Elijah, itself, as I am to talk about what I think that the Lord is saying in this. So I was, as I was watching this video... Yeah, it really did. It, 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 it did touch my heart. And, you know, and as the, day, as the day went on, I'm hearing the song, and it's like, you know, I just I can't get the song out of my head. But here's the thing. Two or three more days into the week, and I still got the song, Days of Elijah, and I can't get it out of my head. You ever been in that place where something just kind of plays, like it's almost like it goes into, you know, just repeat over and over and over again. And so I'm sitting, you know, after a while I'm like, okay, this is not normal. I know, it, I know there are some songs I can listen to over and over again, and I can kind of like sing, you know, through that day. But, but now I'm like, okay, getting into the week here, and I'm hearing days of Elijah, I just, I'm like, God, what are you saying? Because I, I don't think this is just circumstance here. And, you know, if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, we've been having some awesome Wednesday nights here. And where we're, you know, we're learning about the prophetic We're learning about how God speaks, how to recognize the voice of God. You know God speaks in many different ways. And so that being the case, and I'm thinking, okay, God, what are you saying here? What is this all about? What is the song Days of Elijah about here? What are you trying to say? So I get into Scripture. I get to the Old Testament. I start reading about Elijah. How many of you are familiar with Elijah? All right. So I'm reading in 1 Kings. And as I'm reading in 1 Kings, I realize, wait a minute. There is something here. And as I'm reading in 1 Kings, I realize, okay, there are some major parallels to what was happening in Elijah's day to what's happening today. And I'm like, wow, this is something. And you know, one of the things that God has shown me is this, is that where the church is at today, we've got to be in a place of where we're able to discern the times and understand what's going on by the Spirit. Okay? All right? And, and I think this is kind of, it's like, I think the church has kind of been in a season where we've just kind of got into same old, same old. We've kind of gotten a rut into a routine. And, and I'm like, all right, okay. And so as I'm reading in 1 Kings, what the Lord was showing me is that we're in a day where there, there are some similar, some, some similar parallels to what was going on in Elijah's day. And I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but Elijah was dealing with you know, during Elijah's day, he was dealing with King Ahab and Jezebel. Are you guys familiar with you familiar with the story? And the thing is, Elijah, he didn't, he didn't approach his situation in the sense as he looked at what was going on, all the compromise, the hypocrisy, and what was happening in the nation of Israel. He didn't approach that like, well, everything's just okay, it's all right, you know, it's no big deal. No, Elijah got very, very, very upset about the situation. And so, you know, when we look at that, I think what God is saying here is we need to look at this example that we read about in 1 Kings and that we need to understand that, you know what, there are times that it is okay to look at what's going on and recognize, hey, this isn't right, and that we can actually get upset about the situation. Somebody say amen. Amen. Here's here's what I'm talking about. You know, I said something about we got to be in a place of being able to discern the times. You know, I felt like God put on my heart to tell some of you this, and I know that there's some of you here, and, and, and I think it's okay, okay? But I know, I know that for many of us, this is where we're at right now in the Spirit, that many of us, we're upset, we're looking at what's going on, we're upset, we're angry with what's going on around us. When we look and we see the compromise, we see the hypocrisy, and it's not just in the nation, it's in the church. And I believe that God is saying it's okay to be upset, It's okay to have a righteous indignation rising up within you. See, here's here's what's kind of going on. I don't know how many posts I've seen, you know, in the last month or so where Christians have got on social media, and and, and this is kind of how it's come across. Hey, hey, church, listen, don't get upset about what's going on. Don't get all bent out of shape. You know, Jesus said, Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled, so don't be troubled. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, Jesus preached the message, don't let your heart be troubled. But Jesus wasn't always in the mode of, 
being happy, 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 happy. Here's a good example. You remember when Jesus went into the temple? He goes in the temple, and he didn't go into the temple, and he didn't look around at the disciples and go, hey, guys, I know that, I know that what's going on here, this is now they've turned my father's house into a house of merchandise, and that it's a den of thieves, but it's okay. We can, uh, you know, listen, you remember my message on don't be troubled? That's not how he responded. Jesus walked into the temple, took up a whip, and ran everybody out. And then he preached a message, hey, this is wrong. You've turned my father's house into a house of merchandise and a den of thieves. So gee, the point I'm making here, and I think what God is saying is it's okay. It's okay if you, look around at what, if you look around at what's going on. And it's okay to be upset. In fact, you know what? We're in a place... I think that God is looking for some people who are looking around and saying, this isn't right. This isn't right. My question is, where are those who are grieved over what's going on? Where are, the, where are those whose hearts are broken over what they see? Do we not care anymore? It's kind of like David. King David comes on the scene. And you got the children of Israel. And, 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 they're, and they're, they're going against Goliath and the Philistines. And the children of Israel, 40 days and 40 nights, they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. And David comes on the scene and, and he's like, what's going on here? Doesn't anybody care? Is there not a cause in the land? And this is where I believe as a church, we've got to be very, very careful today that we don't fall into this, this kind of same old, same old, well, it's okay. It's a, you know, no, it's not okay. And I believe that what God is saying, if you're upset, if you're grieved, if you're grieved in the spirit of what's going on and what you see around you, it's okay. It's okay. In fact, that's probably where we need to be right now. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? You know, just this week, I posted on Facebook. I'm telling you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like being the guy that everybody looks at and goes, oh, man, he's hard or he's mean. But when I saw it on Facebook, I'm like, okay, I can't let this go. you got a church in Nashville that's growing. It's growing in leaps and bounds, and it's become a popular church. And, then, and they have no problem. They're not even, they don't even hide it. They're okay with going public and saying, well, we don't believe that the Bible's the Word of God. Well, I'll tell you why they went public like that and why they're saying that. Because they say they're a church for everybody. Anything and everything is okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. When the Bible's not the Word of God, yes, anything and everything's okay. But I believe that what God is saying is that He's raising up a company. He's raising up a church today that's going to walk in that Elijah anointing, that Elijah mantle, and it's not going to turn a blind eye and a, and, and a deaf ear and just, oh, it's, you know, and, and just kind of blow, sweep things under the rug. So I get it. I understand. We don't need to be in that place of where it's all okay because it's not okay. We're in a place of where the church has got to make a stand like David did with Goliath and like Elijah did with Ahab. Elijah was a prophet in Israel. Ahab was the king in Israel and he was married to, you know who? Jezebel. And what, most, what a lot of people don't realize is is that the Bible says that Ahab was the most wicked king ever in the... I mean, in the history of Israel, he was the most wicked. Do you know how wicked he was? I mean, I want to read something to you. I want, to see, I want, I want you to see what was going on in Elijah's day. And so to understand how wicked he was, we've got to kind of back up. We've got to go back to Solomon. This is what the Bible says that King Solomon was like. Check this out. 1 Kings chapter 11, it says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned to his heart after other gods. Check that out. That his wives turned his heart after other gods. You see, 
let me, let me just kind of squeeze some stuff in right there and understand. First of all, Solomon has already broken the commandments of the Lord because he's married heathen women. When God made it very clear you're not to marry outside, you're not, you're not to, you're not, you know, if they're not daughters of Abraham, you don't marry them. They got to be in covenant. And Solomon broke the commandment. And so it says, for it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not uh, fully follow the Lord as did his father David. And then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now this was what Solomon did. But yet the Bible says that Ahab was worse than Solomon. So in this situation... Elijah looks at what's going on, what's happening with King Ahab and Jezebel, what's going on in Israel, and he says, no, this is wrong. And he, he sets out to go and to confront Ahab. See, he didn't let a spirit of fear get to him. Now, actually, there is a point, if you know the story of Elijah, where he, because there's so much intimidation and so much opposition that it does have an effect on him. But God gets in that situation and takes care of that. But, but when we look at Elijah at the very beginning, Elijah's not going to put up with this. And so Elijah goes up to Ahab and he says, Enough is enough. This is wrong. What you're doing, Ahab, is wrong. And you know how Ahab responded? Ahab responded by calling him the troubler of Israel. Ahab responded by calling Elijah the troubler of Israel. Now, let me, let me tell you how important Elijah was. How significant Elijah was. A lot of people don't realize this. There might not be an Old Testament book of the Bible named after Elijah like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel. But did you know that Elijah was the, he was the prophet of prophets? We see that comparison being made between uh, John the Baptist and Elijah. We also see there's that example in the New Testament where Jesus goes up the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a very, very important story. And as he goes up the Mount of Transfiguration, he takes... He takes Peter, James, and John with him. I don't know if you know, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this, Jesus, there were, there were different spheres of relationship with Jesus. He had his inner three, Peter, James, and John. Then there's the 12. Then there's the 70 that you remember he sent out to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, and they did. They went out and they did exactly what he told them to do, and they came back rejoicing that, hey, <laughs> you know, We've seen mighty miracles. Then there's the 500 that was with him on the day of the ascension when he ascended in the heaven. And then on the day of Pentecost, check this out, there's 120. My question is, what happened to the others? There's always, here's, here's some wisdom, there's always a dwindling. There's always, as you, yes, there's always a falling away. We, that's why we have to guard our hearts that we don't grow cold on the Lord. Some, somehow, some, I mean, in that time period between the ascension and the day of Pentecost, there was a falling away. Jesus told them all to go to Jerusalem and wait. What happened to all the 500? Only 120 showed up. But when you look at that, you look at that model You've got the inner three, you've got the 12, you've got the 70, you've got the 120. And I don't know about you guys, but I want to be in the inner circle. I want to be like Peter, James, and John because that's where it was happening. It was Peter, James, and John. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him in the, in the raising and the healing of Jairus' daughter. 
It was Peter, James, and John that were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane when he told all the other disciples to stay here and he went on a little further to pray. But guess what? He took Peter, James, and John with him in that. I want to be with Jesus in that sense. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, he takes Peter, James, and John with him up the mountain. I don't know about you guys, but I want to go up the mountain with Jesus. Don't leave me down here. I want to go up. I want to be with you, Lord. I want to be right there with you. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is what you got going on. You know, they go up the Mount of Transfiguration and all of a sudden, check this out, Moses and Elijah appears. Moses and Elijah. Now understand, we're, talk, we're talking about two Old Testament characters that lived hundreds of years back in the past. They've come, it's kind of like a back to the future kind of thing. All of a sudden, you've got, Elijah, you've got Moses and Elijah shows up. And, and check it. Here's how Peter, James, and uh, yeah, here's how they respond. Well, Lord, you want us to build three tabernacles? One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you? And then there's a voice from heaven. An audible. Everybody say audible. audible. A loud, audible voice from heaven that says, This is my son. Listen to him. And so that moment, in that moment, what you have, you've got Moses who represents the law, and you've got Elijah who represents the prophets. The law and the prophets always point to Jesus. The law and the prophets always speak of Jesus. And they were there to show where their allegiance was. Moses' and Elijah's allegiance was with Jesus. But in this, the point I'm making, how significant is Elijah? So significant that on the, the day of the Mount of Transfiguration, it is Elijah that shows up. Elijah is a very, very, very important character in the Old Testament. And so in this, and you know, getting back to the days of Elijah and what God is saying, I believe that God is saying that this season that we're in right now, this season is like the days of Elijah. And that we're going to have to understand what Elijah was like because it's going to take an Elijah company. It's going to take a church that understands the anointing of Elijah that's willing to walk in that anointing and wear that mantle to be able to deal with what's going on around us. Because just as Ahab called uh, Elijah the troubler of Israel, get ready. It's coming. Christianity... We're coming to the place where Christianity is going to be so hostile that people are going to start calling us. Now, here, here it is. Check it out. You bunch of haters. You heard that? Because we won't give in to what the political correct thing is. We're going to stand on the Word of God. We're not going to compromise the Word of God. I hope we're not. And already because we won't compromise the Word of God and we say, no, this is what the Word says. That is wrong. We're getting called haters. I saw, I saw this big Facebook drama thing yesterday. Where, <laughs> unbelievable. Where you had this kid crying out. He was all tore up and, man, his life was in a mess because he was dealing with certain temptations of the past that he once got delivered from. And here was what was crazy. Christians, so-called Christians, got on the post and said, it's okay to live like that. No, it's not. That's not what the Bible says. This is what I want to say. You got all these people giving godly advice on Facebook, and they're not even quoting God. They're making up their own stuff. This is where we're at today. And this was what was going on in Elijah's day. And Elijah said, no. You know, we were talking this week. Brian, Brian had an excellent perspective on what's going on. And, I mean, and, 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 you know, and, I, and I said to Brian, I said, Brian, I, look, I'm 59 years old. And I've been serving the Lord, I mean, seriously committed and in the ministry for over 25 years. And I've never seen the stuff that's going on today going on around, like it's going on today. We are literally in that place where the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 5.20 said, Woe to them who call evil good and good evil. Now think about that. This is where we're at today. I mean, everything's twisted. Everything, 
Everything's crazy. That's what's going on. It doesn't make sense. And so, and this is what I want to say, church. This is why we have to know the Word of God. This is why we got to be close to God. That when even the church, God forbid, is compromising the Word, that we'll know that that's wrong. And we can say, no, that's wrong. And this is what the spirit of Elijah was all about. Elijah's heart was broken. His heart was grieved over what was happening in Israel. And I believe that right now God's heart is grieved over what's happening in this nation, what's happening in the church. And we need to see change. But how's that change going to come? I know somebody's going to say, repentance, pastor. Yes, but how's that going to happen? It's going to happen when people stand up wearing that Elijah mantle and walking in that Elijah anointing and representing God in the right way and making a difference. And so that being said, there's three things that stand out when you're reading, when you're reading the life, when you're reading about the life of uh, Elijah and you're looking at Elijah's ministry. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot more. But there's three things that I want to address this morning that I want to point out. Number one, that accompanied Elijah's ministry. Number one, that during Elijah's ministry, there was a a heightened and an increased uh, level of prophetic revelation in Elijah's day. If you read, as you're reading about Elijah and you're reading the, the, the narrative or the story of Elijah, what you'll see is you'll see it over and over and over again. It says, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I mean, my goodness. I mean, Elijah was walking in such close relationship with the Lord. Man, they were in constant conversation. That's where we need to be today. And what I believe that God is saying that we can have that today. That we can walk in that same anointing and experience that same degree of prophetic revelation today. What what does that look like? Here's what it looks like. It's a fulfillment of Acts chapter 2 when it says, In the last day God said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall shall have visions. (laughs) Come on. In other words, what I believe God is saying, for those who are willing... To walk in that Elijah anointing, wear that Elijah mantle, and whose hearts are grieved over what's going on, and who seriously care about what's going on, not just in the church, but outside the church, in the world, that we're going to be able to start experiencing that increased degree of prophetic revelation, visions, dreams, check it out, angelic visitations. You might be thinking, oh, pastor, that's just crazy. No, it's not crazy, that's God. That's God. That is God. How many of you had visions of the Lord and visions given by the Lord before? Raise your hand. There you go. These things happen. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see all through the book of Acts, visions, dreams, angelic visitations. I mean, just, it's it's, it's awesome. Steve, Steve Page was here this morning awesome brother in the Lord. He sent me an email a couple weeks ago and in that email he said that the Lord showed him that, that we're getting ready, the church is getting ready to, to, to write the second book of Acts. Now think about that for a second. That we are living in such a day that we're going to be able to experience God interacting with his people in such a way that we could literally write a second book of Acts. And if you know anything about the book of Acts, the book of Acts, it was, it, was, it was so much more than just preaching the gospel, which is awesome. But it was more than just preaching and teaching. Signs, miracles, and wonders accompany the witness in those days. And there was incredible signs, miracles, and wonders. Like Peter and John walking up. And there's the lame man. He says, you know, he's, you know, he's begging for alms. And Peter and John respond by saying, hey, gold and silver have I none, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Those kind of things happen on a regular basis. So number one, one of the things we're going to experience is going to be be, uh, increased, heightened prophetic revelation. God speaking with His people. God encountering, us experiencing God encounters. I'm excited about it. The second thing I believe God is saying in this, as it pertains to this season that we're in, it's not just 
heightened prophetic revelation. But check this out. You read the story of Elijah and you'll find out that in the midst of a famine, there was supernatural provision. Now, am I saying a famine's coming? No, I, I, God hasn't showed me anything about famines or anything like that. I don't know of anybody that's prophesying anything like that. But regardless, if you look at the life of Elijah, what, what you see is that during Elijah's ministry, God supernaturally provided. God supernaturally provided. And I believe that in this day we're in, that there's going to be supernatural provision given to those whose hearts are turned to the Lord, those whose hearts are grieved over what they see, and those who are, who are purposed to walk in that Elijah anointing and wear that Elijah mantle. How many of you want to walk in that Elijah anointing this morning? Awesome. That's what this is about. There's going to be supernatural provision. And something else I believe uh, in, in, in studying the life of Elijah and, and what I feel that God has revealed to me in the Spirit is that not only is there going to be supernatural provision as it relates to provision, but God's going to raise certain individuals up in our midst. They're going to be so anointed. They're going to be the ones that we're going to go to that's going to, give, that's going to have the wisdom and that's going to be able to give us prophetic insight on what to do and how to position ourselves so that we can walk in that supernatural provision. And God's all about it. You know, and Jesus didn't just leave this subject alone. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said this. When the disciples came to him and they were saying to Jesus, they were worried about what they were going to eat, what they were going to drink, what they were going to wear. And the reason being because they knew that following Christ was not popular. See, we, there's, there's a lot of things we don't understand about early Christianity. Early Christianity <laughs> was loathed. It was opposed. I mean, you're talking about being ostracized and, and being cut off from the community. That's why they had to gather together supplies and be able to help one another. But Jesus said this as they were worried about these kind of things. He responded to the question by saying, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be taken care of. In other words, what Jesus was saying when you make the kingdom of God first in your life, you make the kingdom of God a priority in your life, and Jesus gave us the promise, then all the rest will be taken care of. You won't have to worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, where you're going to live, because it will be taken care of. So I believe that's, I, you know, I'm like, as I, you know, I mean, we could get... We could get really bent out of shape uh, over what's happening around us and knowing that opposition is coming. It is, church. It's already here. It is already here. But we've just scraped the surface. But in the midst of this, those whose hearts are turned to the Lord, those who are grieved over what they see, and those who really you know, want to see change and want to be used by God to walk in this Elijah anointing, there's going to be supernatural provision. I mean, supernatural provision. And I said this earlier, and I, 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 really, I got a witness to this. Listen, I'm all about name it, claim it, and claiming this scripture and claiming that one. But if your heart's not right and your priorities aren't right, you can name it, claim it all day long. It won't do you any good. You can't break one principle for you trying to use another. You know, and something else that the Lord showed me, it's time to move out of the formula of Christianity. It's time to move in relationship Christianity. And then the third thing, the last thing that stands out is that when you study the ministry of Elijah, you look at what Elijah was dealing with in that day. Elijah was so anointed that Signs, miracles, and wonders followed him wherever he went. I mean, you're talking about a precursor. You're talking about an example of what the early church walked in when we read the book of Acts. Elijah was that example. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi is just full of miracles. Well, it's really not. There's just seasons. There's time periods where... 
There was an abundance of miracles. You know, if you read, there's times when there was a drought for the word of the Lord, where there was no prophetic revelation happening. I mean, we're talking about years. And then there was no, miracles weren't happening. But during Elijah's time period, when Elijah, you know, was dealing with Ahab and what was going on in Israel, I mean, there was an abundance of miracles, signs, and wonders. In other words, what God is saying is, you know what? God's going to back us up. That when we step out to do the work of the Lord, and we step out to be obedient, and we purpose to be obedient to God, what God is saying, He's going to back it up. For those who are willing to stand up against you know, all, you know, what's going on in this nation and in the church, and, and who's willing to, to be a voice representing God and saying no in the name of Jesus, what God is saying is, is I'm going to back it up. It's going to be more than you just going, uh, well, that's wrong, people. God's going to back it up with miracles, signs, and wonders. And we see that with Elijah. Read the story of Elijah. Powerful miracles, signs, and wonders took place with Elijah. You had the, you had the widow's son who died. What does Elijah do? He prays for her and she comes back to life. We see a raising of the dead with Elijah. Then we see the Mount Carmel experience. Where you, had, where you had the prophets of Baal all gathered together, purposed against the Lord. And you know in that, in that day, you know that Jezebel had a hundred prophets killed. God's prophets. Ahab and Jezebel, that was some wicked leadership. You know, one of the things that, one of the things that was going on in that day again, to give you a better picture of what it was like in that day and to, where you can kind of see the parallel of today, was child sacrifice. That's right. That's prophetic. That's confirmation. It really is. God bless her. <laughs> there's, not a, there's not a lot in the Bible that God called an abomination. Child sacrifice was one of them. And one of the reasons that uh, Elijah was so upset and angry is because Ahab had done just like Solomon did. Solomon married outside of the children of Israel and he married heathen wives who served heathen gods. And then Ahab did the same thing because Jezebel was not a daughter, daughter of, uh, of Abraham either. And what she pushed, one of the, I mean, she was very instrumental in Israel in manipulating Ahab to do this and do that. And one of the things was, was the worship of Molech. Molech was the god of was, was a God that they sacrificed their children. And, I mean, there, there are even paintings of this. And if you read the story of Molech, this is what really upset God and it upset Elijah is that the children of Israel would bring their babies. And they would literally sacrifice their babies, throwing them in the fire, sacrificing their babies to the God Molech. Church, we got the same thing happening today. We sacrifice our babies to the altar of abortion. Just mind-boggling that just recently that we had a, a, a group of politicians all gathered together. And what did they do? They, they literally mind, they celebrated, they, they celebrated babies being aborted in the third trimester. We got a video, we, you can see it on video where all these politicians, when they, when, when, when the, when the executive order is signed, they start cheering this on. You know, we're not talking about first trimester, second. We're talking about aborting babies in the third trimester. Now think about that. Those babies can live. And then you had a house full of politicians cheering it on. They did the same thing in Elijah's day. They did the same thing in a lot. Church, that is a spirit. Now, 
With me saying that, I, I, I realize that there may be someone here that in your past, maybe that's a part of your past. If you remember, Julie and I have had to repent. Listen, there's repentance. And we serve a good God. We serve a loving God where there's grace and there's mercy. And if anyone has participated in anything like that, there's grace and there's mercy. But just because, see, this is what the devil tries to say. He said, the, the devil tries to get the church in this place that if you, since somebody maybe has done this or it's in somebody's past, that you can't address it. It may hurt somebody's feelings. No, somebody's got to stand up and say this is wrong. Who is going to be a mouth for God in this season, this, this time period we live in? Who's going to stand up like Elijah and say, no, enough is enough. It's wrong. You know, people say, well, pastor, church, abortion needs to, that's a political issue. Wrong. Abortion is not a political issue. Abortion is a biblical issue. So these three things, and I believe speaking to this church, I, I am so thankful. I am so glad to be a part of this church because I know where we're at as a church. I know what you believe and where you're at. And I believe in this season that we're in that God, as that anointing gets stronger and God uses us to stand up and be his mouthpiece, to stand up against the, the evilness, the wickedness that's in the land, that, that God's going to come through. He's going to back it up. He's going to back it up with with increased and heightened prophetic revelation. There's going to be supernatural provision. I mean, I mean in such an incredible way. God's going to make himself known, church. And there's going to be miracles, signs, and wonders. You believe that this morning? Let me get you to stand.